obviously, last time we saw you, you were in a heck of a lot of pain, man. It was, it was tough to see you like that. So uh, what, what, what exactly did it end up being, and, 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 you know, what was that recovery process like for you? You know, I popped um, two pieces of cartilage underneath my bone. Um, I think I may have popped it a little bit earlier in the fight. And just to try to breathe um, was very hard. And then put myself in a situation where um, I was on a, on the mat, and I try to grab a guillotine so I can try to get my heels to my butt so I can try to get up to my feet. And when I did that, it popped again. So um, really, I stayed here another two or three days just because it was too tough to breathe and move around. Stayed in Vegas, and then just it's really nothing you can really do besides just endure the pain and just be comfortable and take pain meds and stay off of it and just you know ice it. So it took several months uh, for me to get back to normal, but I'm ready to roll now. Yeah. So I was actually a little bit surprised. Like I thought the turnaround was kind of fast. I mean, did, yeah. did you, was that like a goal for you that like, Hey, I got to get back in there or, or did you just go, well, they, they offered and I'm, I'm kind of feeling all right. Um, you know, I really didn't think about that. The time frame. you know, um, contrary to a lot of people believe I like to be active when I was <laughs> champion. I had, you know, me and John Jones, the only one that had defended the belt four times in a year. So I like to fight, and once my body started feeling better, you know, it was it was better for me to deal with, you know, the, the fights that happened before than just to crawl up on a rock. So I think a, a champion really comes back and show you guys what he's made of. Let's say, I mean, the veteran that you are and everything that you've accomplished and you got other things going on, I mean, when you go through pain like that that just completely immobilizes you, does that start making you think a little bit? Like, man, is it worth going out there and doing this stuff anymore? It's always worth it. I mean, that half a millisecond of, oh, one, oh, nobody can screw me on a scorecard or you knock the person out or you get a phenomenal performance, you know. It's, it's crazy enough, but that's what we do it for. We get back in there over and over again for that chance that we get that one moment. And for me, I got another gear. I got another level I can actually reach the tools and um, the skill sets I possess. I haven't always shown it. And, um, you know, when I fought Darren Till, that's probably the closest to one of the most perfect fights I've had. And um, I just want to try to do better than that. So for me, you know, it's a part of the game. It's a part of the, it's a part of the journey. I didn't understand it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, the way things went down. But at the end of the day, you know, I just got a quick question in God and just go out there and do my thing. Yeah. So obviously, you know, everybody's talking about the losses that you've had to deal with. We're talking about literally number one, two, and three in the world. You're not getting finished. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what do you take out of those? I mean, you're talking about it's the process, right? I mean, do you look at the results or do you look at, you know, how you performed and, and, and what do you take out of that? I mean, you're literally fighting the absolute best in the world. You know, I was in L.A. for um, a bulk of this training camp, and I was um, working with Antonio McKee, and I was staying with my buddy, Lynn Oden. He's a director for Cobra Kai, the number one film on Netflix. And um, he was just telling me, he said, one thing that a director told me, he said, be performance-centric, because you can really control your performance. And I just know that with me performing to the level that I can perform, everything else is going to pan itself out. I'm not going to have to worry about wins and losses. I'm not going to have to worry about bonuses and big fights. And I think I was focused so heavily on proving people wrong so many times in my career that um, it took away from focusing on proving people right. I got 20 or 30 people I got to prove right, coaches, loved ones, kids, training partners, um, people that really support me from the beginning. It's millions of people you got to try to prove wrong. So for me, just really focusing and really just understanding that life is not always a straight path. It can be, but we make choices, and I made choices in my life that kind of veered me off that path, and um, those are things I have to deal with, and, you know, quitting is not an option. I got to go out on top like I plan to do, and the way I saw myself in the beginning of this sport, that's not the way. It wasn't losing to these guys, and, and though they were, you know, the champion and one and two, but on paper, you know, I'm a better fighter than all of them. So there have been times in your career where it feels like you're fighting with a chip on your shoulder, fighting angry. Do you feel like, in retrospect, that was the wrong approach? It worked for those moments, and, but I didn't need to. Um, I should have just been fighting because I'm, I was the best. I should have been fighting to prove that everything that we worked on, everything that we did uh, made sense, and it did. It always made sense. I never, I never ever went into a fight not prepared, not in shape, not ready, not trained, not um, cautious and, and conscious of everything that – my opponent could or could not do. So with that said, there's nothing I've ever been surprised with in there. You know what I mean? Never. And for me, focusing on just the performance alone would have solved so many different problems. Sometimes you may have seen a little bit more rah-rah out of me, but that should have came out anyway. Nobody should have to make me mad. Nobody should have to say I couldn't do something for me to do that when I know I already can. 
Do you have the role planned out for Cobra Kai? You're going to get on there, right? Do you? For sure, for sure. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but yeah, I'm, I'm on there somewhere. I dig it. Talk about Vicente Luque. I mean, you were the guy. That was I just wonder if he's on your radar. Cause like for the longest time, people came to you, right? You didn't have to watch out for the division. They're coming to you. So was this somebody you were watching at all and thinking, oh, but we're going to cross paths at some point? You know, I always watch these guys, and they, all, they still look coming for me. Even, like, think about the old rubric of the sport. Someone off of a loss usually fights somebody off of a loss. Not in my circumstance, you know. I can lose one, two, three, four, ten fights in a row, and I'm still the five-time world champion that was maybe right underneath George St. Pierre for being the best that ever did it and fighting trying to be the best. So for me, it's just like I was always Usman's biggest fight. I was Gilbert's biggest fight. I was Kobe's biggest fight. But before then, Darren Till was my biggest fight. Robert Lawler was my biggest fight. Carlos Conner was my biggest fight. Koshek was my biggest fight. And I needed to think of those guys in that way, and I didn't. So Luke K, for me, I think very heavy-handed, great in brawling, very tough chin, durable, good conditioning. Um, he's finished so many fights in the final seconds, you can't ever count him out. And um, he's my biggest fight. Yeah. And to be fair, he was here earlier and said this is his biggest fight, you know, for fighting sure, a former sure. champion. So uh, last thing for me, Ty, you said wanting to go out on top, man. Is, is that the drive right now? Like what, what gets you into the gym every day? What, what gets you to still – because I know it takes a lot of sacrifice and discipline to perform at this level. So what, what drives you at this point? Performance, performance. I just see myself you know, controlling, controlling the variables that I can control. And I've trained. I put my body through the fire. I'm ready to go. And – just performing, performing. Like, I don't even know how I can say it any different way. Um, I'm trying to draw some more fancier $50 words for you, but that's all it really boils down to is performing. And I do that against him, and I just focus on who's in front of me. Every fight is the biggest fight, and then after that, it's the next biggest fight in performance. And if I can do that, I think I'll be fine. Tyron, you mentioned the Darren Till performance and how it was nearly perfect. Does that performance and then going from that to the next three fights make it harder to understand why the things aren't going your way in the cage? Because you went from a perfect performance to less than stellar ones. Yeah, I mean, it's always confusing because you've been at the top for so long. You've been out the red corner for so long. And I told myself my last loss is my last loss. You can tell yourself anything you want, but if you don't go out there and exercise your free will, you know, things can happen in Octagon. These guys were training while I was recovering from injuries. you got to recognize that. Very few fights did I not come out with either a surgery requiring injury or going into a fight with an injury. And that's just the fight style I fight. When I fought um, Damian Maya, I tore my labrum on the first punch. I was trying to take his head off. You know, he closed his eye, but I shattered my labrum on the first punch. Same thing with Kelvin Gaslam. Same thing with Darren Till. I tore my CMC joint trying to crack his nugget open. And I think when you're fighting to that style where you're just trying to put that kind of um, demolition, you know, and that kind of violence in a, in a performance, you're going to get injured. And I fought through those fights, and many of them I won. And um, in, the, in between me recovering, my opponents and my adversaries, they were training. They were getting better. And they were watching film, and they were, you know, with their team. And the time I took breaks, there's also seeds I planted. You know, you got to recognize that when you're at the top, you got a lot of opportunity, a lot of exposure. you got a lot of VIP, a lot of party, a lot of things you can get into. And I got, in, I got into the lifestyle for a while. And... You know, I think karma's real, and I think you got to pay the piper at the end of the day. So I just believe that those last storm bushes are gone. I feel like I've done things now. I've done things even in those last three fights. I trained my ass off. I was so ready. I was prepared, and I just didn't understand. And everything that I did to get to the top wasn't the training camp that I was in. It was the years and years before that put me in that position. So now I feel like I've, I've paid it for it. You still have time to turn things around, but... The story of a fighter getting to the top and then getting into the lifestyle, like you said, it, we've seen it time and time again. Do you think that's something you'll regret after no. this all and done? No, because I'm I'm here. It, it didn't kill me. It didn't it didn't it didn't it didn't take me away. It didn't decapitate me from the sport. And I think the story is better. The story is better when someone comes back. The story is better when somebody didn't quit. You know, and you know, I'm 38 years old. I'll be 39 in a couple of days. And I'm still I'm still on top. I'm still fast. I'm still explosive. I'm still probably the best mind in our division as far as IQ and knowing what's going on. Like, even when I wasn't doing, you still can look in my eyes and know that I can see stuff. Why is he taking it? He can avoid that. You know what I mean? I'm still there. So, for me, um, I don't regret it because I think everything is a part of the story. Everything is a part of the life. And like my mom said, you can't undo done. It's done. So, what am I going to harp on it?
That's a cool saying. Uh, we've seen it before as well with fighters. They have a bad run of form, and then it's almost like they, they feel they have to make a drastic change to get things back on track. Did you ever feel like, oh, I might just move to middleweight, or I have to walk away for a couple of years? Or did you think of any drastic changes, or did you think, no, I just need to stay on the path that I've carved already? My lifestyle was already drastic. I already trained drastic. You know, I don't know how much more I could have taken on my body anyway. So I just needed to focus on my mindset and being willing to put yourself into the fire, not wanting to say, oh, okay, I'm going to go out here off I get this quick knockout. Or, oh, you know, I mean, this person's good, but they're not anywhere near as the other guys I've competed against. Or, or just really just being okay with the worst-case scenarios. I can be hurt, I can be losing, I can be down on the cars, and I still got to find a way to win. I can be winning, somebody can come back and clip me with a shot, and I got to keep it together. Or it can be a barn burner, and it may be one punch or one combination or one takedown or one um, escape or one get back up from the ground that, that solidifies the win. You got to be okay with all of that. You got to be okay with that you go out there and you perform your ass off, and a judge didn't see it your way. If you're okay with all those different outcomes, what, what are you scared of? You know, so I don't really need to do anything more. I mean, I've trained with Antonio McKee years and years back. One, shit's hard. Nobody, <laughs> nobody want to just willingly, openly just walk in there and do this shit. So for me, I had to take myself out of position where I can call the shots. And that wasn't just with McKee, but that was with Dean. That was with Eric Brown. Everybody, you know, no, nah, we going again. No, nah, another round. No, nah, push it. You going eight today. We're not doing six. Push your head back. Breathe. Move forward. Hands up. You know what I mean? And just the training partners. You know, my training partner that's in here somewhere, he was, he was screaming out, we're going to suffer together, we're going to die together. I kept saying, he said it for weeks. I said, hold on, man, we ain't finna die. <laughs> hold on, all this, I get it. We ain't finna fucking die in this motherfucker. But I know what he meant. He meant die to the spirit so you can live in the, die to the flesh so you can live in the spirit so you can freely go because it's really spiritual out there. No matter what you believe in, when your body is done and you know you really physically shouldn't be able to do more. Your spirit kind of takes over. Adrenaline, you go on autopilot. But if you don't do it in the practice room and you don't push yourself through it in the practice room, you're not going to do it in a fight. So, Last thing for me, it's not a particularly pleasant question, but over the past few months, we've seen names like Overeem, De Santos, Romero, been let go from their contract to the UFC. Is there any concerns that after this fight, that could happen to you? I could have got let go before this. could have got let go after Gilbert. could have got let go after Usman. Could have got let go after Teal. It's not up to me. It's up to the organization. And I'm grateful that I got another chance to go out there and show myself. And in doing so, you guys will get a chance to watch as well um, what I am, how great I am. So I can't think about that. I'm thankful and I'm grateful. And sometimes in the past, you know, I had to recognize that I didn't run the organization. And whether I thought they should have promoted me a certain way or did certain things, that ain't, they got 600 athletes to think about. It wasn't always about me. And I may have figured that out a little too late in the game, but at the time, you know, I just, I never really trusted a lot of people. Like, I grew up in the street. I grew up gangbanging. And, you know, it's trust and respect is earned. And I don't trust. I'm always, my head's always on the swivel. I'm always looking around and making sure my surroundings are good. I live in the murder capital of the fucking country. You know what I mean? I got to move a certain way. So I connect dots and I put things together. And I'm thinking this is what the intent is. And then I always want to prove it wrong. So... Um, if I could look back, maybe I would have just focused more on performance and the things I can't control. I can't control what's behind the scenes. So to answer your question, that's not even in my mind right now. Thanks, Tyron. Tyron, right here. Uh, we spoke with Vicente earlier today, and he said he remembers his first interaction with you when you were backstage at UFC 205. You complimented his uh, wrestling boots. Uh, and he said after that, it, it was a really important moment to him because at the time mm -hmm. you were the champ of his division. He was like, oh, the champion likes my shoes. Do you remember that interaction at all, first meeting with Vicente? I remember before that. I remember the Ultimate Fighter show. I remember him fighting um, Graves. I remember him, you know, I, don't, I think he only lost one fight on the show. I remember, you know, um, him always being the guy that was put out there to fight, but never got a lot of the credit. Usman got a lot of credit for the show, but Vicente was fighting a lot of those fights. So um, I never let these up and coming guys catch me by surprise. So my eyes been on him for a long time. He had a great, great fight against Nico Price. He had a great fight against even Wonderboy Thompson. You know, Wonderboy did what he did best in the second and third round, which is to, you know, evolve and shift, but he still was in the fight. He never, he never stopped trying to walk him down. So um, I appreciate that, and I definitely respect Vicente. I've always have, and um, you know, I know he's coming after me, and I, and, and, I, and, I, and I sense that, and I feel it, and, and I welcome the smoke. 
Do you still think he's in that position where he doesn't really get the respect that you know how good he is, but maybe his ra- his ranking isn't indicative to his skill set or something? I mean, Do you still think we're he's not, like I'm that? not fighting a number. I'm fighting a, a, an opponent. So the real ones and the, and the true people that study the sport and the real fighters, they would think I would be an idiot to, to really underrate this, this young man, especially someone that's continually getting better and better and better and punching harder and harder and harder and uh, finding ways to just – he has a really good rubric, you know, watching film and breaking them down. He really, he's kind of sneaky on the way he sets the fight up. He's, he's puts you in bad position. He kind of backs you in the corner where you're forced to go to one place where he does really well. And um, a lot of people um, don't recognize that because he doesn't talk a lot about it. He don't talk a lot in general. And he just kind of goes out there and do it. And I used to be like that. You know, I let people think that I was just this athlete and I just had a one big right hand. and. For years, I just allowed that to happen on purpose because they really underrated my, my mind and how, how high of a fight IQ I had. So by the time they figured out what I was doing, it was too late. And finally, uh, you mentioned yourself, like you like you were a champion, you defended your title four times, and you liked to be active. But if you look at the top five of this division, none of them have fought each other outside of the champion. So as someone that used to sit atop this division, is it frustrating at all to see that no one in the one through five are seem willing to fight. They're all kind of calling for the title, not willing to be matched up. Um, I, I can't focus on that. You know, I gotta, I gotta focus on my legacy. You know, I gotta get it back in order, get it back on track. So, um, to be real honest, I haven't, I haven't really watched a lot of it. Hey, Tyron, over here. Uh, right here. Uh, Tyron, at this stage of your career, how do you measure growth in your game? Because obviously after all the big fights and where you're at, you're not about to drastically change your style to look completely different. So how do you measure that growth? How do you know that? Or I don't know, are you about to be throwing a lot of head kicks, flying knees, looking like Adesanya? I mean, the good thing about it is you get a chance to watch on Saturday. Thank you. I can tell you anything. I can tell you I can go out there and throw a million punches and slam him on his head and break his neck and... I can go out there and watch paint dry again. So I'm just not really into telling you guys what I'm going to do. I'd rather just show you on Saturday. Tyron, you mentioned uh, losing the chip on your shoulder. What was the, the moment or the, the catalyst that kind of – I never said that? that. I never said I lost a chip on my shoulder. I said I redirected it. I'm not out to prove people wrong. I'm out to prove my people right to steal the chip there because my kids are watching me. They see me win big. They see me lose big. They see me at the top of the top, and they see me drop down. They see people say shit about me. And one thing they've never seen me do is quit. So the chip is very much still there. It's just a different one.